Start off understanding that seawater has a certain amount of salt in it. If you take away some of the water, you have the same amount of salt, but less water. So it's going to be more salty. Make sense? So the salt is going to be more concentrated. The water is going to be heavier. OK? All right, so the question now is, how do you take away the water? Two ways. One is by evaporation. The other way would be by forming an iceberg. <coughs> Why by forming an iceberg? Because ice forms only from the fresh water it leaves the salt behind. OK? All right, so. Salinity can be changed by concentration. <coughs> if you change the concentration by either evaporation, if you change the concentration of salt either by evaporation or by forming ice, you make the water more saline. The more salt you have, the more dense the water, or in other words, the heavier the water. Okay? All right, the other thing to consider is the opposite. What's the effect of dilution? In other words, adding more <coughs> fresh water. Fresh water can be added to the ocean in two ways. Number one, you have <coughs> fresh water flowing into the ocean, mainly by rivers. That's going to cause the water to be more dilute. It's going to make it less dense, less heavy. So, rivers pouring into the ocean, less dense, less heavy. In addition to rivers, you could have <clears throat> um, icebergs melting. Icebergs melting. Same thing. Adds fresh water, so it makes it less dense, less heavy. <coughs> All right. So, Archimedean forces. What changes the density of water, the weight of water, if you to, to speak of it in a more elementary way? The temperature and salinity, changes in temperature and salinity is going to change the density of water. And if you make water more dense, it's going to flow under some less dense water. If it, it's less dense, it's going to flow over another body of water, another current. Wait, can you repeat that? <clears throat> I'll repeat it, but it's, you probably didn't get it only because <clears throat> you haven't had a chance to think about it. So put it this way. If water is, if you have a body of water over here that's less dense than a body of water over here, and they come, they meet each other, which is going to go under the other one? The, one that's more. the heavier one yeah. is going to go under. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well. Let's take a look at what this means in reality. Generally, we tend to think of the oceans as being uniform. They're not uniform at all in terms of their salinity. I'll just give you some numbers. I don't, well, the first number you should know. The open ocean is about, on average, 35 parts per thousand salt. 
Open ocean is about 35 parts per thousand salt. This is the symbol parts per thousand. Think about it this way. If you want to talk about percent, if we were talking about percent of something, let's suppose 10 percent, if we symbolize it this way, what that means is parts per hundred. Percent just means parts per hundred. You got two zeros there, it's parts per thousand. And so, seawater is about 35 parts per thousand out in the open ocean, open ocean. There are places where the salinity of seawater is very different. So if you go to the Western Baltic, that's an area that, it's an ocean, the Baltic, uh, the Baltic Sea. That's an area with a lot of land around it. It's kind of an enclosed ocean. It's 12 parts per thousand. The Gulf of Finland Another place that is surrounded by land and has lots of rainfall, you have a salinity of 0 0.6 parts per thousand. 0 0.6 is almost fresh water. It's an area surrounded by land with lots of rivers pouring in. So, open ocean compared with areas that are affected by lots of fresh water pouring in, the water here is a lot less dense than in the open ocean. Now we can take a look at another extreme example, and this is not a sea, it is not an ocean, but it'll give you an example of extreme salinities, and that is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea between Jordan and Israel is called the Dead Sea because the salt concentration is so high that very few organisms are capable of living there. The salt concentration is about 4.6, excuse me, not 4.6, 46 parts per thousand. 46 parts per thousand. There is so much salt there that it is impossible to sink. You can't sink in the in the Dead Sea. And the reason it has such a high salt concentration is that a lot of the water has been diverted. A lot of the fresh water that would be coming down the river has been diverted to go into Jordan and to go into Israel. As a result, there's no more fresh water input. So you're just left with this salty area under relatively hot conditions. The, the, the fresh water keeps evaporating, and it keeps getting more and more salty. Very few organisms are capable of living under this condition. The one that turns out to be fairly important for an industrial um, use is Dunaliella salina. Dunaliella. Salina. It's a phytoplankton. It's a phytoplankton. And Salina stands for salt. There's a place in Puerto Rico called Salinas. And that was a place that uh, they used to mine for salt. They used to collect salt water, put it in an impoundment, and let the fresh water evaporate, and the salt would be left behind. Hence the place was called Salinas, which just means salt. So whenever you see Salina, Salinas, or the word salary, you know the word salary? You know the origin of the word salary? I know that. Go ahead. So basically, in ancient Rome, uh, the Roman government would pay the soldiers with salt. Why? What made salt so valuable? It was rare. But this being rare, what? What? Do you know what? What? Particular value? What what did they use it for? The salt? To preserve food. Yeah? Preserve to preserve food. food, exactly. Yeah, salt was difficult to get. You'd have to get an impound water and let it evaporate, or you might have had deposits of salt and you would mine it. But salt is great for preserving food. Why? Because when you add salt to food, it sucks the water out. 
bacteria can't decompose. And without water, bacteria cannot decay anything. They need the food to be moist. That's why we talked about salt cod the last time, <coughs> and which made uh, New England rich. All right? Salt cod, salting cod, allows <coughs> cod to be shipped all over the world because it wouldn't rot. All right? So before the days of refrigeration, salt was valuable for preserving just about everything. Yes? Um, is fresh water diverted from the Dead Sea naturally or naturally? Uh, fresh water, now a lot of the fresh water is deliberately being taken out of, I think it's the Jordan River coming down, if I'm right. And the Jordan River is used for agriculture in, jo in, in Jordan and Israel. So the water that's flowing down is being taken and it's not flowing into the Dead Sea. Okay. The Dead Sea used to be less saline before this water began to be diverted. Okay. So, remember, Archimedean forces has to do with the density of water. And all these things we talked about change the density of water. And the question is, who gives a damn? Well, it's important because Masses of water with different densities, when they come in contact, the more dense water will go under the less dense water. And the impact of that is extraordinary, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit. But you need to understand the basic physical <coughs> aspects of this. All right. So now let's talk about the significance of currents. The significance of currents. Number one, Currents can circulate vertically, not just horizontally. We tend to think of currents moving, masses of water moving sideways. Well, water can move up and down. And we've talked about water moving up and down. We've talked about vertical circulation. <coughs> so, in the summertime, around this area, you have the warm water up on top. You have the whole cold water down the bottom. And all the primary production is occurring up at the top. Primary production, <coughs> meaning phytoplankton that are being produced there. And all the decomposition is occurring down at the bottom, meaning the bacteria are taking all the dead organic stuff. Anything that falls down from the top, the rain of organic materials. <coughs> you know, fish feces and dead phytoplankton and dead something or you name it, whatever dies or whatever produces waste products falls down to the bottom and the bacteria start decomposing all this stuff. So they're taking, bacteria taking organic material, organic compounds, and turning it into inorganic compounds, like nitrogen, and phosphorus, and magnesium, and calcium, and you name it. And it is all these inorganic compounds which are needed by plants for photosynthesis. But those inorganic compounds are now down at the bottom. They're locked in this cold, dense layer, and they can't circulate upwards because, in effect, you have two bodies of water, a warm body and a cold body. This warm body is very light, less dense. And down here, you have the more dense cold water. So two separate bodies of water, just as if you had a layer of oil over water. And so this organic material is locked down here, and so you have biological stagnation. Once all these nutrients get used up here, you have no nutrients at the surface. Down here, you have no oxygen because all the oxygen is being used by the bacteria. And so now you have biological stagnation. You can't have any more primary production up here. You can't have any more decomposition down here.
But when the density of water then begins to change, as you start to get into fall and winter, basically what happens is this surface water loses heat. It loses heat to the air. You have less sun coming down in fall than you did in summer, so less heating of the water. You have heat leaving the water, and so the surface water becomes less and less dense as time goes on, and eventually the density difference between top and bottom is so different that wind blowing across will create eddy currents which push this water down, which in turn push that water up, push the surface water down, which forces the bottom water up, and you have vertical circulation. Okay, so this is one reason why you need to understand that waters can be of different densities. You got less dense warm water here, more dense cold water here. As a result, all the nutrients disappear from here and all the oxygen disappears from there. You got two separate bodies of water based on their density. And because there are two separate bodies of water, they don't mix. <coughs> when the density changes, when this becomes less, uh, excuse me, when this loses heat, the density of this comes closer to this, and finally a little wind is able to call, cause overturn, cause the mixing of the bottom and the top waters. Very important to maintaining life in the ocean. All right, so that tells you about the importance of vertical circulation. How about the importance of horizontal circulation? Just checking the red light is still on, okay? So we're still recording. Horizontal circulation. Very important for the distribution of organisms in the ocean. Horizontal circulation is important for the transport of organisms. <coughs> I think I mentioned to you a particular kind of ten of uh, a particular kind of snidarian which is Portuguese man of war. Did I mention Portuguese man of war to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so it's uh, got a beautiful kind of floating gas bubble. Looks like this, but kind of iridescent purplish green. It's absolutely beautiful. And hanging down 30 feet or so are colonies of polyps with stinging cells. And I told you that uh, a woman on a ship where I had been lecturing said that she swam into this and those tentacles draped over her back and it was like having a blowtorch right on her back because all those little toxic stinging uh, cells really did a job on her. Anyway, this is a tropical organism. If you go down to Florida, you see them all over the place. You know where England is? England is almost near the Arctic Circle. You will find tropical man of war in the waters around England. Why? Because of the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream takes some of the organisms from tropical waters over here, rotates them around to over here, where England is, and now you can find tropical organisms in the waters around England, such as the men of war. Anybody over here a cowfish? Cowfish is a tiny little fish like this, uh, at least the ones I've seen. A little like this, and they call cowfish, they kind of kind of like have a square appearance. Uh, kind of look like this, kind of strange. 
Here's the fins back here. And it's got like two horns over here. I'll call it a cowfish because of the horns. <laughs> Tropical fish. I've caught them in, in nets. When I was doing some work on the Hudson River, I caught cowfish. Tropical organism in Hudson River, right out you know, a few miles from here. Why? Because they got <laughs> carried by the currents, primarily by the Gulf Stream. Okay. Seahorses. I've gotten the seahorses, also tropical. Gotten seahorses in Hudson River because they got carried by this current. So, transport of organisms. There are lots of organisms that depend on the currents in the ocean to get from place to place. Think about what we saw when we went to Long Island Sound, that rocky coast. We saw snails. You know where the snails came from? They were part, their juvenile forms were part of the plankton. So basically, whole loads of organisms as juveniles are part of the plankton. If I recall correctly, a juvenile snail looks like this. It's got cilia, swims around. It gets primarily carried by the current. I was down the Jersey Shore, down the beach once, and I saw all these little particles in the water. Didn't know what they were. Brought them back to the laboratory. They were crab zoe. Crab zoe. Z-O-A. Basically, juvenile crabs that didn't look, they don't look anything like crabs. Jeez, I can't, can't even draw it. So it's a really weird looking thing. It looks nothing like crabs, very angular. Now, I won't even leave that on the board because it doesn't come close to it. Look up crab zoe, Z O A. Basically, a juvenile form of crabs. <clears throat> I used to, my family used to go crabbing on the Hudson a lot. Okay, we used to go up on the rocks, throw crab nets in, and one year, they, crabs would be all over the place. Another year, there wouldn't be any crabs. Why? Well, because a current carrying the juvenile crabs one year drove them into the Hudson. Another year drove them someplace else. Okay? So snails, <coughs> crabs, barnacles, sea anemones, all of these organisms that you can see on any coast, they all came there as part of the plankton. They all came there as part of the plankton. They were just pushed around by the currents. There are also some fish, such as striped bass, that have floating eggs. In fact, it's very important for striped bass to have their eggs floating because if they settle down to the bottom, they would be covered over by the sediment and they would suffocate. So striped bass have to have their eggs floating. They get carried by the currents, moved here and move over there. Wherever the current is going, that's where you're going to have a high concentration of striped bass. Baby eels, we talked about this in the beginning. Eels basically hop the current, the Gulf Stream, which brings them where they're going. Okay, so. Think about horizontal circulation, currents moving from place to place. <clears throat> it's called the Gulf Stream. Just the, moving from place to place, especially the planktonic organisms. Because plankton, many plankton are only plankton <coughs> as juveniles. As adults, they become something else, like barnacles, snails, and, and so on. Okay? And of course, the regular plankton, you know, things that always stay planktonic, uh, like Calanus and the phytoplankton, they also get pushed from one place to another. Okay, now your question. Go ahead. Um, it's, uh, it's called the Gulf Stream? That the, the Gulf Stream is that, is that current that moves up from the Sargasso Sea and up along our coast. Okay. Right. All right, so horizontal circulation is important for the transport of organisms. Juvenile fish, some fish eggs, all of these invertebrates that are part of the plankton as juveniles. Eels includes, included. All right? Horizontal circulation is also important for commerce. All right, so one, transport of organisms. Two, for commerce. 
most of the stuff moves from one continent to the other. Well, if we're talking about Europe and the Americas, it comes by ship. <laughs> because it's a lot cheaper than flying your products from one place to another. You want to put them on a ship. Can you imagine if, uh, if you're, you're buying a Toyota and it all came by, all your Toyotas came by plane? The price would really magnify. Nobody would be able to afford to buy a Toyota. Well, let's take a look at what commerce looks like on the ocean. Here we have, again, North America, there's Florida, and South America, and so on. And let's say here we are, New York, New Jersey area, New York metropolitan area. England is way up here. If you want to go to England by ship, you would think the ship would go like this, right across like that, right across the ocean. Because the straight line is always the shortest distance, right? Between two points? Nah. The straight line is the shortest distance between two points, but it's cheaper and maybe faster if you go this way. You hop the Gulf Stream. You go up here, you go north until you're in the Gulf Stream, and then you go along like this. You let the Gulf Stream carry you, in part. When Columbus came from Europe, he took various currents, take you this way. And when he wanted to go home, he took the currents that went that way. He had to worry about the wind and the currents, but that's what he did. He found what was going his way, and he hopped on it. Another thing that horizontal currents transport is heat. Heat. Heat transfer is very important for regulating land temperatures. In Europe, you have what are called the maritime countries. Maritime countries. What are the maritime countries? Mara refers to the ocean, those that are on the ocean. So we're talking about England, Scotland, Ireland, and um, France, um, Portugal, Spain. If you take a look at England and Ireland, a piece of Ireland goes into the Arctic Circle. A piece of Ireland goes into the Arctic Circle. We tend to think of England is, and Ireland is being right across from us. They're at a much higher latitude, a much higher latitude. And if you go to England and Ireland, in some places you will see palm trees. <laughs> if they're always in the Arctic Circle, how can you possibly have trees that grow only at warm temperatures? And the answer is the Gulf Stream carries heat over here, making these countries much warmer than those countries that are inland, making these countries much warmer than those countries that are inland. You had a question? Wait, it's not a question. I've been to the UK a lot, and um, because it's so high on the globe, that's also um, the reason why the sun comes down much later in the day. Depends on what season you're in, but yeah, yeah. in the summer, you're right. That's yeah, right. In the like in the summer and spring, it comes down much later yep. than in New Jersey. Yep. Yeah, absolutely right. In fact, I, I recall being startled. I was driving around Ireland at 1030 at night without headlights on. 1030 at night, no headlights needed because you're in a much northerly uh, you're in a much northerly uh, latitude. And if you go further up, then all winter, excuse me, all summer, it's daytime all the time, right? 24 hours a day. And in the winter, it's night 24 hours. Okay. Yeah, it's really amazing to... Uh, there are towns in Alaska where it's like nighttime, where it's like dark all day in like the winter. Yep might be a depressing place to live. 
Uh, funny thing is, we have no real appreciation of, of uh, very little appreciation of the sun. In, in France, for example, uh, if you're looking for a house or you're looking for an apartment, uh, especially apartments, it'll say avec soleil, which means with sun. They're advertised that sun comes into the apartment, and that apartment is worth a lot more money. Why? Because France in the winter can be uh, Paris, for example. Uh, I shouldn't say all well, France, talk about Paris, uh, can be pretty dreary. You know, it's got kind of a haze all the time, uh, you know, it, it's damp and, and like foggy. And without seeing the sun every once in a while, it gets to be a little depressing. Uh, supposed to be that the, the suicide rate in, in uh, Scandinavian countries is much higher than elsewhere, uh, and they attribute that to having less sun. People with seasonal affective disorder, um, psychological condition where they get depressed, um, they're often, one of the cures for that is expose those people to high intensity light, you know, artificial light in order to, to get them out of that depression. Basically, it comes out to this. Without sunlight, without light, it's depressing. You, know, it's, you, you, feel, you feel a little bit more down than, than, than we, uh, we have sunlight. OK, you had a question? Um, so you said heat transfer maintains literature? It maintains the warmer temperatures in these maritime countries, the countries along the ocean. Basically, the heat is being transferred from the tropics over there. So given the latitude that these countries are in, you'd expect them to be very cold. And in fact, they're not very cold. OK. Uh, quickly, and then we'll take a short break. Um, all right, so you've got vertical currents, you've got horizontal currents. How are these currents measured? Well, they were measured in a very simple manner years ago. <coughs> and this was using basically a wine bottle. <coughs> You take this wine bottle, you'd write a note in it, and you'd say, if you find this wine bottle, take the note out and mail it to me. So I'm a marine biology laboratory. Say, mail it to me, tell me what date you found the bottle and where you found it. So basically what you do is you put a note in the bottle, you put a cork on the bottle, and you throw it out in the ocean. And if you do it off the coast of New Jersey, it may end up in England someplace, or in France. And they would mail it to you, and you know that it took three months to get there, because they put the date down that they found it. And you know the current from New Jersey went all the way to France. This is called the old surface drifter. A really simple way to measure currents. A little problem with this, however, and the problem is that sometimes the currents are moving in this direction where the wind may be going in this direction. And you have a piece of this bottle sticking out where it can be affected by wind. And so somebody came up with a very simple solution. You put a sea anchor, basically some line attached to big pieces of metal like this. Whoops, did a bad job on that. You got a piece of metal there, you got a piece of metal going in this direction. You're doing a bad job. Basically, <laughs> you got two weighted, two surfaces which are in the water, and since they're in the water, and attached to the bottle, the currents will have more influence than will the wind. So this is called the modern surface drifter. Because it will be pushed, it, it will be less favored, it will be more favored by the currents than it will by, uh, be favored by the wind. And you get a more accurate understanding of which way the currents are going. Well, there are also bottom currents. 
how can you possibly measure bottom currents? Well, you do that by using what's called a bottom drifter. Same idea, except you make the bottle heavier so it sinks all the way to the bottom, and you put a little piece of wire with a hook on it. And you still got the note inside. And the currents are going to carry this. Where's it going to carry it to? Well, when fishing boats come along, they drag along the bottom, they'll pick up one of these. And they'll send it over to, you know, whatever marine biology laboratory uh, or oceanography scientists were interested in what currents are pushing things along the bottom. And bottom currents are very different from upper currents. Okay? They're more dense. They, this current down here can go in an entirely different direction than up here. Well, these are the kind of old-fashioned methods of finding out which way the water is moving, which way currents are moving. Today, we have a very neat instrument, which you simply lower from a boat. And you got your line down here, and it kind of looks like this. Kind of looks like a weather vane a little bit. It's got tail fin like on an airplane, <coughs> and it's got a little propeller over here. And what you do is you drop it down from the boat, and because it's got this tail like on an airplane, it will orient facing the current. All right, so if it's facing this way, it means that the current is moving in that direction. And not only will the cable that goes up to your instruments up in the boat tell you what direction it's turned to, but it'll also tell you the speed of the current because a fast current will make this propeller turn faster. A slow current will make it turn more slowly. This is not a propelling propeller. It is pushed by the, the movement of water. So you'll know the direction of current and you'll know the speed of the current. In fact, one piece of equipment that we used which serves this purpose is called a hydrolab. And not only did it tell you the speed and direction of currents, but it would take water samples and tell you the salinity of the water and the oxygen concentration in the water concentration of oxygen in the water. Okay? That was just figure if you're going to lower an instrument down there, well, let's find out more about these currents. Let's see how much salt is in them. Let's see its oxygen content. And there are a few other measurements that I could give you as well. <coughs> so it's a really neat instrument to use. All right. Let us take a, a break and Take, uh, what is, we'll do a five minute break, all right? Come back and we'll, we'll finish up this business on currents. Remind me to turn the video recorder when we come back, please.